Chapter fifty three of the Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What John Westlock said to Tom Pinch's sister, what Tom Pinch's sister said to John Westlock, and what Tom Pinch said to both of them, and how they all passed the remainder of the day. Brilliantly, the temple fountain sparkled in the sun and laughingly its liquid music played and merrily the idle drops of water danced and danced and peeping out in sport among the trees plunged lightly down to hide themselves as little ruth and her companion came toward it and why they came toward the fountain at all is a mystery they had no business there it was not their way it was quite out of their way they had no more to do with the fountain bless you than they had with love or any out-of-the-way thing of that sort. It was all very well for Tom and his sister to make appointments by the fountain, but that was quite another affair, because, of course, when she had to wait a minute or two, it would have been very awkward for her to have had to wait in any but a tolerably quiet spot. But that was as quiet a spot, everything considered, as they could choose. But when she had John Westlock to take care of her, and was going home with her arm in his, home being in a different direction altogether their coming anywhere near that fountain was quite extraordinary and why they came toward the fountain at all is a mystery for they had no business there it was not in their way it was quite out of their way they had no more to do with the fountain bless you than they had with love or any out of the way thing of that sort it was all very well for tom and his sister to make appointments by the fountain but that was quite another affair because, of course, when she had to wait a minute or two, it would have been very awkward for her to have had to wait in any but a tolerably quiet spot. But that was a quiet a spot everything considered as they could choose. But when she had John Westlock to take care of her, and was going home with her arm in his, home being in a different direction altogether, their coming anywhere near that fountain was quite extraordinary. However, there they found themselves, and another extraordinary part of the matter was but they seemed to have come there by a silent understanding yet when they got there they were a little confused by being there which was the strangest part of all because there is nothing naturally confusing in a fountain we all know that what a good old place it was john said with quite an earnest affection for it a pleasant place indeed said little ruth so shady oh wicked little ruth they came to a stop when john began to praise it the day was exquisite and stopping at all it was quite natural nothing could be more so that they should glance down garden court because garden court ends in the garden and the garden ends in the river and that glimpse is very bright and fresh and shining on a summer's day then oh little ruth why not look boldly at it why fit that tiny precious blessed little foot into the cracked corner of an insensible old flagstone in the pavement and be so very anxious to adjust it to a nicety if the fiery-faced matron in the crunch bonnet could have seen them as they walked away how many years purchase might fiery face have been disposed to take for her situation in furnival's inn as laundress to mr westlock they went away but not through london streets through some enchanted city where the pavements were of air where all the rough sounds of a stirring town were softened into gentle music where everything was happy where there was no distance and no time there were two good-tempered burly draymen letting down big butts of beer into a cellar somewhere and when john helped her almost lifted her the lightest easiest neatest thing you ever saw across the rope they said he owed them a good turn for giving him the chance celestial draymen green pastures in the summer tide deep littered straw yards in the winter no start of corn and clover ever to that noble horse who would dance on the pavement with a gig behind him and who frightened her and made her clasp his arm with both hands both hands meeting one upon the other so endearingly and caused her to implore him to take refuge in the pastry cooks and afterwards to peep out at the door so shrinkingly and then looking at him with those eyes to ask him was he sure now was he sure they might go safely on oh for a string of rampant horses for a lion for a bear for a mad bull for anything to bring the little hands together on his arm again they talked of course they talked of tom and all these changes 
and the attachment mr chuzzlewit had conceived for him and the bright prospects he had in such a friend and a great deal more to the same purpose the more they talked the more afraid this fluttering little ruth became of any pause and sooner than have a pause she would say the same things over and over again and if she hadn't courage or presence of mind enough for that to say the truth she very seldom had she was ten thousand times more charming and irresistible than she had been before martin will be married very soon now i suppose said john she supposed he would never did a bewitching little woman suppose anything in such a faint voice as ruth supposed that but seeing that another of those alarming pauses was approaching she remarked that he would have a beautiful wife didn't mr westlock think so yes said john oh yes she feared he was rather hard to please he spoke so coldly rather say already please said john i have scarcely seen her i had no care to see her i had no eyes for her this morning oh good gracious it was well they had reached their destination she never could have gone any further it would have been impossible to walk in such a tremble tom had not come in they entered the triangular parlour together and alone fiery face fiery face how many years purchased now she sat down on the little sofa and untied her bonnet strings he sat down by her side and very near her very very near her oh rapid swelling bursting little heart you knew that it would come to this and hoped it would why beat so wildly heart dear ruth sweet ruth if i had loved you less i could have told you that i loved you long ago i have loved you from the first there never was a creature in the world more truly loved than you dear ruth by me she clasped her little hands before her face the gushing tears of joy and pride and hope and innocent affection would not be restrained fresh from her full young heart they came to answer him my dear love if this is i almost dare to hope it is now not painful or distressing to you make me happier than i can tell you or imagine darling ruth my own good gentle winning ruth i hope i know the value of your heart i hope i know the worth of your angel nature let me try and show you that i do and you will make me happier ruth not happier she sobbed than you make me no one can be happier john than you make me fiery face provide yourself the usual wages for the usual warning it's all over fiery face we needn't trouble you any further little hands could meet each other now without a rampant horse to urge them there was no occasion for lions bears or mad bulls it could all be done and infinitely better without their assistance no burly drayman or big butts of beer were wanted for apologies no apology was wanted the soft light touch fell coyly but quite naturally upon the lover's shoulder the delicate waist the drooping head the blushing cheek the beautiful eyes the exquisite mouth itself were all as natural as possible if all the horses of araby had run away at once they couldn't have improved upon it they soon began to talk of tom again i hope he will be glad to hear of it said john with sparkling eyes ruth drew the little hands a little tighter when he said it and looked up seriously into his face i am never to leave him am i dear i could never leave tom i'm sure you know that do you think i would ask you he returned with a well never mind with a what i am sure you never would she answered the bright tears standing in her eyes and i will swear it ruth my darling if you please leave tom that would be a strange beginning leave tom dear if tom and we not be inseparable and tom god bless him have not all honour and love in our home my little wife may that home never be and that's a strong oath ruth shall it be recorded how she thanked him yes it shall in all simplicity and innocence and purity of heart yet with a timid graceful half determined hesitation she set a little rosy seal upon the vow whose colour was reflected in her face and flashed up the braiding of her dark brown hair tom will be so happy and so proud and glad she said clasping her little hands but so surprised i'm sure he had never thought of such a thing of course john asked her immediately because you know they were in that foolish state when great allowances must be made when she had begun to think of such a thing and this made a little diversion in their talk a charming diversion to them but not so interesting to us at the end of which they came back to tom again 
ah dear tom said ruth i suppose i ought to tell you everything now i should have no secrets from you should i john love it's of no use saying how that preposterous john answered her because he answered in a manner which is untranslatable on paper though highly satisfactory in itself but what he conveyed was no 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 sweet ruth or something to that effect then she told him tom's great secret not exactly saying how she had found out but leaving him to understand it if he liked and john was sadly grieved to hear it and was full of sympathy and sorrow but they would try he said only the more on this account to make him happy and to beguile him with his favourite pursuits and then in all the confidence of such a time he told her how he had a capital opportunity of establishing himself in his old profession in the country and how he had been thinking in the event of that happiness coming upon him which had actually come there was another slight diversion here how he had been thinking that it would afford occupation to tom and enable them to live together in the easiest manner without any sense of dependence on tom's part and to be as happy as the day was long and ruth receiving this with joy they went on catering for tom to that extent that they had already purchased him a select library and built him an organ on which he was performing with the greatest satisfaction when they heard him knocking at the door though she longed to tell him what had happened poor little ruth was greatly agitated by his arrival the more so because she knew that mr chuzzlewit was with him so she said all in a tremble what shall i do dear john i can't bear that he should hear it from any one but me and i could not tell him unless we were alone do my love said john whatever is natural to you on the impulse of the moment and i'm sure it will be right he had hardly time to say thus much and ruth had hardly time just to get a little farther off upon the sofa when tom and mr chuzzlewit came in mr chuzzlewit came first and tom was a few seconds behind him now ruth had hastily resolved that she would beckon tom upstairs after a short time and would tell him in his little bedroom but when she saw his dear old face come in her heart was so touched that she ran into his arms and laid her head down on his breast and sobbed out bless me tom my dearest brother tom looked up in surprise and saw john westlock close behind him holding out his hand john cried tom john dear tom said his friend give me your hand we are brothers tom tom wrung it with all his force embraced his sister fervently and put her in john westlock's arms don't speak to me john heaven is very good to us i tom could find no further utterance but left the room and ruth went after him and when they came back which they did by and by she looked more beautiful and tom more good and true if that were possible than ever and though tom could not speak upon the subject even now being yet too newly glad he put both his hands in both of john westlock's with emphasis sufficient for the best speech ever spoken i am glad you chose to-day said mr chuzzlewit to john with the same knowing smile as when they had left him i thought you would i hope tom and i lingered behind a discreet time it's so long since i had any practical knowledge of these subjects that i have been anxious i assure you your knowledge is still pretty accurate sir returned john laughing if it led you to foresee what would happen to-day well, i am not sure mr westlock said the old man that any great spirit of prophecy was needed after seeing you and ruth together come hither pretty one see what tom and i purchased this morning while you were dealing in exchange with that young merchant there the old man's way of seating her beside him and humouring his voice as if she were a child was whimsical enough but full of tenderness and not ill adapted somehow to little ruth see here he said taking a case from his pocket what a beautiful necklace ah how it glitters earrings too and bracelets and a zone for your waist this set is yours and mary has another like it tom couldn't understand why i wanted two what a short-sighted tom earrings and bracelet and a zone for your waist ah beautiful let's see how brave they look ask mr westlock to clasp them on it was the prettiest thing to see her holding out her round white arm and john oh deep deep john pretending that the bracelet was very hard to fasten it was the prettiest thing to see her girding on the precious little zone it obliged to have assistance because her fingers were in such a terrible perplexity it was the prettiest thing to see her so confused and bashful 
with the smiles and blushes playing brightly on her face like the sparkling light upon the jewels it was the prettiest thing that you would see in the common experiences of a twelvemonth rely upon it the set of jewels and the wearer are so well matched said the old man that i don't know which becomes the other most mr westlock could tell me i have no doubt but i'll not ask him for he is bribed health to wear them my dear and happiness to make you forgetful of them except as a remembrance from a loving friend he patted her upon the cheek and said to tom i must play the part of father here tom also there are not many fathers who marry two such daughters on the same day but we will overlook the improbability for the gratification of an old man's fancy i may claim that much indulgence he added for i have gratified few fancies enough in my life tending to the happiness of others heaven knows these various proceedings had occupied so much time and they fell into such a pleasant conversation now that it was within quarter of an hour of the time appointed for dinner before any of them thought about it a hackney coach soon carried them to the temple however and there they found everything prepared for their reception mr tapley having been furnished with unlimited credentials relative to the ordering of dinner had so exerted himself for the honour of the party that a prodigious banquet was served under the joint direction of himself and his intended mr chuzzlewit would have them of the party and martin urgently seconded his wish but mark could by no means be persuaded to sit down at table observing that in having the honour of attending to their comforts he felt himself indeed the landlord of the jolly tapley and could almost delude himself into the belief that the entertainment was actually being held under the jolly tapley's roof for the better encouragement of himself in this fable mr tapley took it upon him to issue diverse general directions to the waiters from the hotel relative to the disposal of the dishes and so forth and as they were usually in direct opposition to all precedent and were always issued in his most facetious form of thought and speech they occasioned great merriment among those attendants in which mr tapley participated with an infinite enjoyment of his own humour he likewise entertained them with short anecdotes of his travels appropriate to the occasion and now and then with some comic passage or other between himself and mrs lupin so that the explosive laughs were constantly issuing from the sideboard and from the backs of chairs and the head waiter who wore powder and knee smalls and was usually a grave man got to be a bright scarlet in the face and broke his waistcoat strings audibly young martin sat at the head of the table and tom pinch at the foot and if there were a genial face at that board it was tom's they all took their tone from tom everybody drank to him everybody looked to him everybody thought of him everybody loved him if he so much as laid down his knife and fork somebody put out a hand to shake with him martin and mary had taken him aside before dinner and spoken to him so heartily of the time to come laying such fervent stress upon the trust they had in his completion of their felicity by his society and close friendship that tom was positively moved to tears he couldn't bear it his heart was full he said of happiness and so it was tom spoke the honest truth it was large as thy heart was dear tom pinch it had no room that day for anything but happiness and sympathy and there was phipps old phipps of austin friars present at the dinner and turning out to be the jolliest old dog that ever did violence to his convivial sentiments by shutting himself up in a dark office where is he said phipps when he came in and then he pounced on tom and told him that he wanted to relieve himself of all his old constraint and in the first place shook him by one hand and in the second place shook him by the other and in the third place nudged him in the waistcoat and in the fourth place said how are you and in a great many other places did a great many other things to show his friendliness and joy and he sang songs did phipps and made speeches did phipps and knocked off his wine pretty handsomely did phipps and in short he showed himself a perfect trump did phipps in all respects but ah the happiness of strolling home at night obstinate little ruth she wouldn't hear of riding as they had done on that dear night from furnival's inn the happiness of being able to talk about it and to confide their happiness to each other the happiness of stating all their little plans to tom and seeing his bright face grow brighter as they spoke when they reached home tom left john and his sister in the parlour and went upstairs to his own room under pretence of seeking a book 
and tom actually winked to himself as he got upstairs and thought it such a deep thing to have done they like to be by themselves of course said tom and i came away so naturally that i have no doubt they are expecting me every moment to return that's capital but he had not sat reading very long when he heard a tap at his door may i come in said john oh surely tom replied don't leave us tom don't sit by yourself we want to make you merry not melancholy my dear friend said tom with a cheerful smile brother tom brother my dear brother said tom there is no danger of my being melancholy how can i be melancholy when i know that you and ruth are so blessed in each other i think i can find my tongue to-night john he added after a moment's pause but i can never tell you what unutterable joy this day has given me it would be unjust of you to speak of your having chosen a portionless girl for i feel that you know her worth i am sure you know her worth nor will it diminish in your estimation john which money might which money would tom he returned her worth though who could see her here and not love her who could know her tom and not honour her who could ever stand possessed of such a heart as hers and grow indifferent to the treasure who could feel the rapture that i feel to-day and love as i love her tom without knowing something of her worth your joy is unutterable no no tom it's mine it's mine no no john said tom it's mine it's mine their friendly contention was brought to a close by little ruth herself who came peeping in at the door and oh the look the glorious half proud half timid look she gave tom when her lover drew her to his side as much to say yes indeed tom he will do it but then he has a right you know because i am fond of him tom as to tom he was perfectly delighted he could have sat and looked at them just as they were for hours i have told tom love as we agreed that we are not going to permit him to run away and that we cannot possibly allow it the loss of one person and such a person as tom too out of our small household of three is not to be endured and so i have told him whether he is considerate or whether he is only selfish i don't know but he needn't be considerate for he is not the least restraint upon us is he dearest ruth well he did not seem to be any particular restraint upon them judging from what ensued was it folly in tom to be so pleased by their remembrance of him at such a time was their graceful love a folly were their dear caresses follies was their lengthened parting folly was it folly in him to watch her window from the street and rate its scantiest gleam of light above all diamonds folly in her to breathe his name upon her knees and pour out her pure heart before that being from whom such hearts and affections come if these be follies then fiery face go on and prosper if they be not then fiery face are vaunt but set the crunch bonnet of some other single gentleman in any case for one is lost to thee for ever End of chapter 53